Okay, so good morning everyone. Uh, this session is about research-based policy design and I think everyone will agree that this, we have heard of very wide ranging um, you know, uh, of issues and topics from kindergarten in Mahasarakam all the way to the New York Fed. I think that indicates to me that research-based policy, de policy design applies to almost everything that we do, uh, be it from the way we raise our children to the way we regulate our financial markets. Um, the point seems to be that doing things by, by, fee by gut feeling, by intuition, or by pure logic is sometimes not enough. And that's why we need, da need data and research um, to, to support that. So I would just like to open the floor up to any questions that you have uh, gathered during the, the, the morning. Um, you can put your hand up and, and we can take a first round of questions. Down there, please. Okay. Hello. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Tanya Mat from Konkan University. First of all, thank you uh, to all the presenters uh, for uh, such wonderful uh, presentations. Uh, I just have a couple of uh, easy questions uh, about the for Dr. Flavio and also uh, Dr. Kilenton. Now, the first question for Dr. Flavio, which is really easy. Uh, what are some of the, like you, you have your human capital formation uh, function and uh, the input uh, variable is, is the, the X, right? Uh, I'm just wondering what are some real world uh, Xs that, that uh, you consider are, are important? That, are easy, not, not easy, that are possible to, to find data on that you have used. Okay. And, and for Pity, talking about uh, how to make this uh, program uh, sustainable in, in the long run, uh, you mentioned that uh, teachers, the, the current teachers, aren't, aren't always going to be uh, receptive to change because it's just more work for them. And the current solution that this program does is to bring in uh, teachers from outside. So, so I'm wondering what, what your opinions are on how uh, sustainable this, just keeping a different te set of teachers uh, to keep operating the program instead of trying to bring in the current teachers uh, on board with the program. How, how uh, possible you, you think that is? Thank you. Okay, anybody else? We can just take a few questions, I think, uh, in the beginning. Yes, please. Well, my name is Tu from uh, UTCC. I have some uh, small question for Ajahn, uh, for Professor Kunya. So it uh, it's come from the uh, the fact that you present in the uh, in the uh, production functions. So the first thing is that you compute a closed form solution from um, the mean of the production function. So I wonder um, when we have the true production function and when we compare with the mean of the belief exp uh, the belief production function, would it change if the realization of the production function is not the mean. Would it change the result? How would it change the result? So that one is the first question. And the second one is a little bit more practical since um, uh, in the rural area of Thai, so we know that uh, the grandparents would take care for several kids at the same time. So uh, they might have some experience about uh, have uh, about raising the kid, so how would uh, that experience would change the belief? Yeah, that is one, and I have one little more is that um, uh, the what we have for now is that in the rural area we have all the all main caregivers staying at home with the kid, and it's it seems that we want to change the belief. We want to change the belief, but uh, even they have mobile phone, they have uh, TV, they have internet at home, they have all the information. But 
it's still difficult for us to talk with them. So how would we communicate with uh, local people and especially for old people to change their beliefs, to take care, so to have better raising the kid? Yeah, so I just have some small question for you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so uh, yes, just uh, Ajahn Patama, where do you come from? Uh, thank you for the very interesting presentation for three of you. Uh, but I would like to ask uh, Dr. Virachat about some just some simple background about the when you study and the, the items of no parents. It seems that every category activities expense are low. Uh, uh, for for expense, I understand that it might be lower than other groups, but for time, I'm not quite sure. Is that because of uh, they need to work and no time to take care of children? But if the, they are grandparents and they're getting old, probably they have more time. So I just would like to have some background inside. Thank you. Okay, so I think the first round uh, it's mostly to uh, Flavio and Ajahn Richard. You, you can maybe Flavio go first and then Ajahn Richard. Uh, so le let me address the question of uh, inputs. So uh, this is uh, super interesting. It's, uh, it, 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 this is where the, a lot of the research has been evolving in terms of how to measure investments in children. Um, nowadays, I, the way I do in my own uh, research is trying to measure the quality and the quantity of interaction. Quantity of interaction is measured by the amount of time. Quality of interaction is uh, about uh, the number of uh, uh, conversation turn counts. It turns out that um, if, you, if you follow uh, um, the, the conversations of adults with children, uh, let's say that you ask parents and children to uh, each say 100 words, it turns out that the fraction of the words that are going to be verbs and, uh, and uh, substantives and adjectives are going to be pretty common across, across, uh, across these groups. What's really different is the amount of time and the quality of the interaction. So, um, so, that's, uh, so that's very, very pervasive. Um, traditionally, we used to measure this by looking at uh, just, for example, the amount of money parents spent on things. And turns out that that was not as predictive as uh, child development. Also, uh, what's really interesting is we are now showing that if you can improve the quantity and the quality of interaction, you do have impact on um, on child interaction on child development as well. So, uh, they 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 all said that they are these are easy questions. It turned out to be it took me years to actually <laughs> to answer those questions, but that's okay. Uh, so so um, the story about information uh, that they have TV and they have internet. Let me tell you a little story that happened with me. Um, four years ago, um, uh, an NGO in the United States found out that I was interested in the issue of beliefs, and they 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 had they started this campaign on uh, through social media on trying to raise awareness about the importance of interaction. It turned out that at that time I still had a Facebook account. I had to close my Facebook account for not reasons associated with belief, uh, something else. Um, and uh, what's interesting about uh, Facebook is that you actually can see who's following the, uh, who, who are the people following that information. And what was really interesting is a lot of the people that were following the NGO were researchers in uh, child development. So, it's, it, so in other words, the, the NGO was telling researchers that belief, that belief is important, that belief is important. So, um, and the reason why I think that is because the demand for information is uh, one thing that also is influenced by beliefs as well. And we see a lot of this, by the way, for example, uh, in the studies in uh, political science in the United States about what channels people actually watch. People that have certain types of beliefs will lead, will choose uh, you know, uh, uh, one channel. People that have other types of beliefs will choose another channel. And I think that the same thing happens when it comes to the way parents want to know about how the best way of raising their child. One of the studies that I wanted to do, but I was never able to raise money, is to look at the social network of parents and to elicit their beliefs of parents in the same network. My intuition is that parents that have certain types of beliefs, 
then to uh, talk to other parents that have the same types of beliefs. Um, the little that I did was a study in Philadelphia when I was trying to, when I was initiating the, um, uh, the, 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 the belief uh, study, I ran a focus group um, from parents that lived in the same neighborhood. I, what I did not know at the time was that those parents actually met every week uh, should talk about child development. They would assign books for them to read. The most central people in the network would have certain interpretations of the book and they would basically put a lot of pressure on their peers so that they would develop exactly the same types of beliefs. So, so I, think that, I think that information, we have, my, own belief, my own belief when I started this work on beliefs was that, oh my God, this is fantastic because information is a public good. My consumption of it doesn't decrease the amount of information for other people. So if I can inundate the world with information, then maybe we can change beliefs. But people actually pay attention or do not pay attention to beliefs. The other question about uh, grandparents, right? So when I wrote down the dynamic model, the one model that actually had learning, because you have this production function that allows for nonlinearity, interactions between human capital and, uh, and, uh, and, inv uh, and investments, what's really interesting is that it creates these informational traps in the following sense. You start with a set of beliefs, you then invest according to the set of beliefs, and what the model tells you is that what, you sh what you're gonna see as child development is exactly what you actually get uh, uh, what your belief system expects it to be, and you never actually update your beliefs. In other words, you start with the wrong beliefs, but you are in this region that I call the informational trap. You invest, you get exactly what you expected, and you actually don't change your beliefs as well. So this is even a different reason why you wouldn't actually learn about, uh, 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 why you wouldn't update your knowledge about beliefs. And it wasn't until we wrote the theory down that we realized, that we didn't realize I am now in the field uh, re-eliciting beliefs after the children are uh, 24 months old. And what's really interesting is we did have a set of parents that were in this informational trap, and it's exactly those parents that we are seeing that they are not changing their beliefs. So then again, this is another situation in which you write down a model and then it generates some predictions that are, seem almost incredible, but then you go and collect data, you re reaffirm those beliefs, and I think that it reaffirmed the, the theory, and then I think that this is where it uh, gives you new ways of thinking about what are the types of policies that can affect these parents that are in these informational traps. Um, <clears throat> so for the first questions that I have, um, well, I mean, to be honest, I think I don't know how about sustainability. sustainability. I need to understand first what's the effect, and then I have to learn about the cost. So I wouldn't claim that what we do now, or, or everything that we do now would be sustainable. That would be too soon to say, right? That, that would be my simple answer. But on top of that, I think just to be clear, I mean, the new program that we do is not like we go teach for them anymore. So we're not gonna go in, in and teach for them. So we're gonna go coach the teacher. So it's, it's a little bit different than, I don't know, I imply from your question. So I think that might be more reasonable to believe that it might be more sustainable. So how, I mean, if it worked, I mean, depend on what's gonna happen. I mean, we have to learn that first. If it worked, you can imagine that you, can, you create some organization or you can have many service providers, pub, I mean, public, private, and then sell these service, right? These consulting service around the country that, that might do it. If we know exactly how to do it, if we know that this will work. The problem is we need to learn first if it's gonna work. Uh, for the second questions, um, so what we see in the, I mean, two parts. In the data that we see, I think they do a lot of caring time. I mean, old parents spend much more caring time than younger parents. I mean, or they, if you look at the, just the, how much time they spend caring the, the children, the, these, old, these grandparents spend much more than the other group. <laughs> but if you look at this intensive activity time, they spend less. I mean, we don't know if it's because age, because they are old, so it's maybe too tired to play with the kid, or it's belief. So that, that's why the belief comes in, in the, I mean, two ways to me. One is to really get rid of the pos other possibility, 
because belief is going to be always there for you to really have an argument that it might be just because they have been raising their child this way. I mean, in the past, where you don't have much resources, you don't spend much time, and you still see, yeah, my kid's still alive and then do something. Or it's really because they're really old now. Playing with a kid is quite, I mean, I have two kids. I mean, it's like, <laughs> it const- it's, it's takes a lot of energy, right? So we couldn't, for now, we still cannot distinguish between these two. But I think it's very important to see which one is which, because if it's just because belief, I think it's still, I mean, it, we, we don't know how to change the belief, but it still might be easier. But it's about aging. It's like, well, what can we do? I mean, it's, it's, it's a, li- a little bit more difficult. Yeah, so actually we talk a lot about the role of parenting uh, this morning in human development. And I may just ask Antoine about parenting economists at the New York Fed. You know, we, actually the Bank of Thailand, we also try to establish a research culture. Uh, uh, not, not establish, just make it uh, a bit more um, um, dynamic in some sense. So maybe you could share some experience about uh, you know, building a research culture at New York Fed. I noticed this really high ratio of RAs to PhD is quite striking, 45 to 60. And also, you raised some examples about um, uh, unintended insights that came from the research. Um, if you look back, say, 2008, where the crisis came, um, you know, a lot of times topics for research are done with a long-term view, not motivated by what's going on today. Uh, did the stock of research that was done before the crisis, but people did not pay at- attention to it, did it come in handy during the crisis in, in unexpected ways? Yeah. Well, so those are great questions. <laughs> so let me just start by saying that uh, listening at, at the, the sort of things that, that T and uh, Flavio are looking at, they're, they're able to do incredible progress on very, very difficult questions. And in some sense, we're looking at much more straightforward questions where there's much less you know, uncertainty and, and difficulties in extracting information. And so, so the, the gains there are, are probably uh, uh, tremendous because we're looking at, at these more questions. Let me address a few things. Um, I mentioned the role of RAs. I think RAs are incredibly important because if, if economists are going to dedicate, if you're going to give incentives for economists to dedicate more time sort of understanding the institution, the culture of the central bank, the institution of the, the markets they have to interact, you have to take them away from some things. And the RAs can do a tremendous amount a very, very good work with data directed by the economists, and that, um, that, that's, a, that's a way of splitting the roles, which I think, I think works very well. In, in terms of, uh, so there's a, there's a great amount of monitoring, uh, of mentoring, I think, that comes between the, the younger economists and the older economists. So the new economists have almost all of their time for research. That's essential because when they start, they have to get in the mode of getting their papers out and publishing and, and the, the first few publications. Are, uh, have a, a great effect on sort of giving them momentum. Um, but over, and over, over time, they, as they get integrated into, into the policy work, then they can use the help of younger economists. And so one of the ways that you can find complementarities is that the, the more experienced uh, economists who have who've worked on, on policy questions can help the new, guy, the new guys sort of come along, and at the same time, those new guys can sort of help take some of the burden in producing good papers. Uh, and so, so I think that, that, that works quite well. The last thing I want to say to, to answer your question, turnover is important, uh, and, and there's, there's, there's a way of, of self-selection. There are people who come, come into New York Fed, other central banks, they do great work, and they decide, I really like academia, I want to do some teaching. And when they leave and they go to great universities, we are sorry to lose them, but that's exactly the kind of turnover we want. And of course, there are people that we hope stay because they've just discovered that policy, uh, the interaction of policy and research is that exciting. And, and of course, we're, we're delighted that, that some of these economists stay. But, but part of the process is that some people come and go, and, and that's just good. Thank you. Uh, so, a second round of questions. You know, all your parents out there, this is a, your chance to ask, you know, something from experts who studied this. I have some of my own selfish questions I'll ask at the end because I also have a, a, young, a young boy, but, you know, um, any, any other questions you would like to raise? Yes, just uh, back there, please.
Good morning. My name is Vara Pong from Monetary Policy Group. I have some question about maintaining research culture at central banks. Uh, so I suppose it's directed for Dr. Martin. Uh, but I, I'd like to hear from other participants as well. Uh, Dr. Pitti already mentioned about maintaining research culture. But one observation that I have here is that we probably don't enjoy the luxury of the economies of scale. We have fewer PhD economists here. The IA system is probably uh, in the pipeline, but not forthcoming very soon. So I'd like to hear your experience and thoughts how we can make the most of this uh, institutional setup. And I'd like to hear your ideas about how to expand or to, or to extend this research capability. Is it incentive scheme that matters the most from your experience, or is it budget? For example, I see uh, National University of uh, Singapore, the NUS, that did very well after the change in incentive scheme. So that's my first question. Uh, my second question is on re maintaining uh, research activity or being research active. Uh, you know publishing is, is one option, but it takes a lot of time and a lot of resources. So can you suggest other options or other ways that we can remain research active throughout the career? Thank you. So I think there is, to some extent, no good substitute for, for good research, and part of the reason is that mm -hmm. one of the way we maintain our skills is by, by being confronted with the peer review process, by having to go out there, present work, get it, getting it criticized. And this is, this is a culture that actually, I think we want to export in other areas of the bank, so that other areas of the bank, this is a problem at the New York Fed, where in some er other areas of the bank, people are not used to being criticized, not, not in a critical way, just in a confronting ideas. And this is something researchers have, and I think they can, they can uh, export productively. Now, one example of the New York Fed is that some people, as they become more senior, transition from doing less academic research and more blogs, for example. And that seems like a fine way to, that, that seems like a good transition, um, because they have more experience with communication, they have more experience with ideas related to policy that can be translated into a language that's useful to communicate to the public. But I don't think you ever want to give up on the fact that these people should remain in the mentality of writing academic papers. And so it's a question of weight. I think you want to avoid corner solution. Going back to about the incentives, I think that if you don't make, research is a painful process. <laughs> Uh, you know, you, you, you write this paper and you're so happy and it looks so good and you send it to a journal and you receive tons of criticism and it, it's, not, it's not easy. And if you don't give researchers some rewards for going through that pain, they're going to stop doing it. Uh, and, and I believe that it's essential to, to maintain that, that sharpness in, in the way we think in order to provide good policy advice. Uh, if, we, if we start losing the willingness to say things that we think are true and get criticized for it, then we're not going to give as good advice to, uh, to our presidents, our governors. Uh, and, and so I think it's very important to keep that. Thank you. Would anybody want to add anything in this respect? Five years already. So, so I, 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 I told T and I had a conversation uh, three days ago when, uh, when I went to visit his in, impressive project. We, one of the things that we said to each other was that we were extremely lucky to be at Chicago at a time that Townsend was there, uh, at a time that uh, Chiapuri was there, uh, and then Heckman and Lars Hansen. Um, a lot of it is um, it, it's exploring uh, complementarities and spillovers. So, for example, I th I, my own guess is that if you have a team of uh, uh, individuals that have common interests, they are going to uh, work with uh, each other and spark new ideas and new collaborations. I think that that would be very important. The other thing that was super important is peer pressure, right? I mean, we had all of our classmates publish, publishing papers and we were not publishing and we felt like losers and oh my God, if I don't publish, you know, uh, Towson is going to yell at me. So I think that that was like a, a, a huge 
<laughs> fear that I had, <laughs> uh, and to this day I still have. Um, so, I, so, so I think that creating a, I think it's really possible to create a culture um, of people that are genuinely uh, uh, curi curious about how to improve the world. And I think that if you have that group of people, they will put so much pressure on the other people to be like them. Then that, that I think is going to be the, uh, that's another way that I think that uh, it works. I think that there, this is way some universities are successful. This is some way that universities are not successful. Um, but I, I agree with you that, so I, I don't agree with research being painful. <laughs> I, I, actually, I actually have had some referee reports that made me cry uh, <laughs> uh, for a few hours, but, 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 in the, but at the same time, uh, once you leave this personal feeling, because there is, I mean, you spent you know, like years thinking about the question, you think this is beautiful, I'll solve all the problems of the world, and then comes the referee and says, this is wrong, and then... <laughs> And then you're like, your first reaction is to cry. Your second reaction is, this is really an insightful comment, and it makes my research better. And, and so, uh, but I do think that at the margin, incentives also, uh, also are important. Uh, but, but, but I think that creating a culture is going to be the number one. And then making sure that that culture survives is creating the right set of incentives. Uh, so that people will maintain that position. I think that I think that's so fundamental because, especially for a central bank. See, I actually I was looking at your, uh, your presentation and I was thinking, man, this is really is important economic research. So so um, um, because it's about how markets regulate, and we know that when markets, these types of markets, we don't have the right forms of regulations, the the, the consequences can be actually tremendously bad. So, so this is the situation, especially in central banks, where I would think that the connection with uh, guiding policy by having very high quality research, both theoretical and empirical, is of fundamental importance because the consequences of having bad monetary policy, for example, oh my God, I grew up in Brazil, I can tell you all about it. <laughs> I see, yes, so uh, Antoine should qualify that central banking research is painful, but maybe not uh, you know, child development research, but you, you want to respond. I, I just please. want to respond. So I agree with everything Flavio said, and I, I want to clarify my comment about research being painful. We, we have this debate at the New York Fed about what is the role of research, and so some people say the reason we give people research time is so we can, so we can attract really smart people who do policy. And when you're in this mindset, it sounds like research is recess. <laughs> and then the, other, the, rest of the, the rest of the folks who are working there, well, why do these guys get to have fun while we're all working? <laughs> and, and research is not recess. Re research is an input into the production function of good policy. And when people are doing research, they're not just having fun. They are doing really hard work, some of which is painful. <laughs> A lot of it is incredibly rewarding. But they're doing really hard work, which is an input into, uh, into the production function for policy, just not like a reward we give them so that they, we keep them around. So that, that's what I wanted to say. So let me respond to Flavio's point a bit because I'm not exactly his classmate, but we are just one year different, so we play soccer together, so we, let's call our classmates. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I'm going to respond to your second point, the peer effect. I mean, just, okay, let's, I'm going to say very honestly, once in a while, I'm going to spend time looking at websites of my friends, right? And we're going to see that my friend has these and that publication. It's like, then I look at my own website and I say, hmm. So, I mean, the point is, it's good once in a while that you might want to do that. It's quite depressing when you see, my, when you see yourself do less, right? But then, of course, you're going to be able to find an excuse explaining why. But on the other hand, it's a reminder that Maybe I could have done something a little bit better, right? But I mean, what I learned from moving back to Thailand is you're not going to be able to dream to have the same number of publications like your friends in the US and stuff like that. But what at least what personally I try to do is I try to keep up on if I have some, I want to have some decent quality that I we have, I have another friend who is Chilean. He would look at my paper and if I meet him, he would say, 
this is not so interesting paper. So I, I don't want that conversation. So that is kind of peer effect that I have to keep in mind all the time. Uh, but on the other hand, I think the, one of the problem is, what I see is, when we think about publication, I think it's very good, but we cannot lead ourselves into quantity too much. I think that, that's a very dangerous part. I mean, it's like doing research is really trying to answer some question, trying to prove, improve something, right? I mean, if you get it as in a published paper, that's great. That's a, it's a very good thing. Then you shouldn't have zero published paper. That's a bad thing. But on the other hand, if you have tons of paper, but then you don't know what is really answer, what is really trying to answer at least doesn't really lead to any improvement in whatever we don't know, then I think it's, a, it's, a, it's something that I, I'm sure that researcher can ask yourself and then try to think that, well, maybe you can slow down in some direction and then improve in the other direction. I think that, that is something that is not easy to do, but I think it's something that you should keep reminding yourself. Keep just some peer pressure in the right level. That would be helpful as well. Thank you. Okay, so actually, in the, that was a very nice uh, discussion. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to open the floor. I won't. I'll save my question uh, for off the stage. Just let me uh, quickly note that you know we talk about development, and today we had a very human side of development, which is I think critical because economics in the end is about the study of human behavior. And um, for those, you know, for me myself, having been a parent, um, like Flavor talked about the importance of time and playing with with the child. Uh, you have who are parents have all read that book, you know, uh, what to expect when you're expecting. And there's one sentence there that when I read, it stuck to my mind and I never forgot and today you confirmed it. It says that the best toy for the child is you. And that's a parent. So let me end with that and thank you all the panelists um, for a very nice session.